good evening friends welcome to the 22nd lecture in the lecture series ay pg series basics to advanced today the topic is on implants in otology and for our two lectures we have two very eminent speakers of international repute the first speaker is dr milin kirtane who will be speaking to us on cochlear implants and the next speaker is going to be dr sunil narayan dat and he will be talking about uh, hearing implants the past present and future kirtane sir of course there is no introduction He is a Padma Shri awardee, BC Roy awardee, past AOI president, current president of the Indian Society of Otology. He has mentored so many, so many centers for cochlear implant, and uh, I, I will be completely right if I say he is the guru of all gurus. And uh, Sunil, of course, I know him since 1991 when he was at uh, KM Hospital and. Uh, our association has been for now 30 years and uh, we've had some excellent lectures and he is currently the president of the uh, cochlear implant uh, surgical implant group i would request dr ninad gaikwad who is our moderator for the evening and dr anil kumar harigop who is the second moderator for the evening dr ninad gaikwad is the professor and head of department at the rn cooper hospital and hbt medical college he is an alumni of km hospital and the nayar hospital he has been the past president of the uh, ay uh, mumbai branch he has several publications uh, national international and his special interest is pathology and uh, laryngotracheal uh, stenosis so may i request dr uh, yogi uh, dr uh, ninad gaikwad to introduce uh, sir formally Okay, thank you, Dr. Samit, for giving me this chance and a proud moment to introduce Dr. Kirtane sir. I have known Dr. Kirtane sir since 1992, the day I joined K, the day I joined Nair Hospital as a resident. That time I was in awe of sir, and I truly, whenever I heard his lecture, I always came back enlightened. There was something new to be learned, and I'm very happy that sir has taken the job of introducing chest and cochlear implants. To all his colleagues and students, and this has really developed me a lot. Sir is at present emeritus professor from KM Hospital. I now hand over the mic to Kethane sir to start his lecture, please. Since I wanted to be short and sweet, that's all I would like to say. He has got so much words to say, but I think it's too short a time for me to go on. Thank you, sir. i'm trying to share my screen so yes does somebody need to allow me to share the screen so yeah okay to, you can go and share screen Okay, so have you got my first slide on the screen, Samin? Miracle of cochlear implant. Yes, sir. We can hear you well, and we can see the. Uh... Okay, so I'm just going to uh, go over a few stray thoughts. Everybody really knows about cochlear implants now. There's nothing much to teach on that. But before I start talking, my journey in otology began because of these two great men, Dr. Joe Disa and Dr. P. P. Karnika, and I really salute them for whatever otology I know today. They were my starting point, and of course, my interest in cochlear implants started when I met this gentleman, uh, Professor Clark, in in Melbourne, and he has been a guiding light and an inspiration in this uh, journey of mine. Today, uh, middle ear surgery, I think we managed to conquer most of the problems. we had a big session of iso last week where we saw so much of middle ear surgery being done but when it comes to sensory neural hearing loss today hearing aids of different kinds and i'm sure sunil is going to tell you more about them is the only answer but when you have a patient coming to you with a sensory neural loss that looks like this 
and you tell him get hearing aids he usually brings out four or five and says look i've tried all these and nothing of this seems to help me because the hearing loss is so profound that no hearing aid is useful and that really brings you to a brick wall there's nothing more that you can do for these patients especially small children that the parents bring to you for delayed speech and uh, you know you just tell them shrug your shoulders or this is what we used to do or two or three decades ago that uh, put them on lip reading uh, sign language with a certain amount of disadvantages in that not that they cannot communicate but certainly lose out on higher education and job opportunity so it does have its limitations and setbacks not being able to hear and very often because of this people label them as deaf and dumb and this is infuriating because they may be tough a deaf but they are certainly not dumb all you need to do is give them their hearing back restore their hearing and they can achieve anything and everything that normal children can you know this lady here helen keller was both blind and deaf and uh, she said that deafness was worse than blindness because blindness separated you from people but deafness from uh, things but deafness separates you from people it leads to a world of isolation and uh, i'll show you that isolation in this next slide this lady has got a child who's deaf the school teacher is telling stories and she tells her take your child away because your child can't hear the expression on that lady's face said it all and imagine for a child to face this time and again not being able to mix up with other children and get the benefit and uh, in spite of the fact that deafness is as severe if not a worse uh, handicap as compared to blindness the blind rightfully deserve sympathy and they get it but the deaf only seem to get ridiculed you can hear jokes about the deaf but never about the blind and in india today there would be about 1 to 3 million profoundly deaf people who could be helped by a cochlear implant Ugh. now when you have an audiogram like this and as we said you came to the brick wall this little gadget no bigger than the keychain in your pocket brought a new dream it was a marvel of modern electronics and modern surgery as compared to the hearing aid and the major difference between the hearing aid and the cochlear implant was that the hearing aid amplifies the sound and it still uses the patient's ear so this is the sound the cochlea is a little deaf the hearing aid amplifies the sound so more sound energy is sent to the inner ear and the hair cells of the patient's cochlea are stimulated for the patient to hear as against this when you have a situation where these hair cells can no longer stimulate or get stimulated by sound there is no generation of electrical signal to the spiral ganglion cells the most powerful hearing aid is useless what you need is the electrical signal to reach here and that is where a cochlear implant comes in basically has two components the external component which is a computer we call it a speech processor but basically it is a computer that receives the sound does not send it to the patient the sound goes into the computer and does what the cochlea was supposed to do convert sound into electrical signals it does it outside the body and then using a transmitter coil transmits these electrical signals to the implant that we house in the cochlea around the cochlear nerve so that it can stimulate the spiral ganglion cells so you are completely bypassing the patient's middle ear and sending electrical signals from the implant straight to the cochlear nerve to go to the brain and be interpreted as sound now you know that the cochlea is like a piano which is curled up so there are different frequencies from the low frequencies here to the high frequencies and that is why you need an implant with multiple electrodes to stimulate different levels of the cochlea so different frequencies can be understood and discrimination of sound into speech is possible and that's why these electrodes housed in the different levels of the cochlea will be stimulated depending upon the frequency of the incoming sound but did we land up with this gadget just by itself no not really a lot of work went into it before we finally came to this product and let us not forget that this guy here is able to put that implant in because he stands on the shoulders of giants who did all the work before him this is my professor from germany i i consider him as a guiding light 
Professor Klaus Clausen, he's a neuroautologist, nothing to do with cochlear implants, but he told me, Milan, if you want to do something new, if you get a new idea and you want to develop it, look at the old books because somebody before you must have thought about it. How true is that when you have this man, Alessandro Volta, putting rods into his ear connected to his dry cell, 1790, and he could hear this sound. Are you able to hear the sound, Sunil? Yes, sir. Very clear. No problem. No, no, not my sound. The sound no. coming from my slide? No, no, no audio from the... Okay, so I'll have to get off and try and uh, uh, get the audio going. Just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so can somebody guide me through this? How do I do that? Uh, let me go down. There is my meeting. Okay, yes, fine. Indrajit, yes. uh, new share, resume share, but how do I get the sound connected? Meeting, hide video panel, share computer sound. Okay. Now, when I switch on, you will see this kind of sound that Volta heard like boiling soup. Can you yes, hear it now? This is what yes, he heard. So he showed that electric current can be heard as sound in the air. And then this man, Dushan, used alternating current instead of the direct current that Volta had used and therefore heard the sound like the flappings of the wings of a fly, but it was an alternating sound. Okay. So both of them had already learned to stimulate the cochlear nerve and make the patient hear sound. The biggest influence, of course, was the development of the telephone, which led to people trying to record voice. In the 1930s, Dudley came up with the voc order, which you could say is really the precursor of the development of the cochlear implant. Then a lot of people worked on it, especially Journo and Eris. In France in 57, they were operating on a cholesteatoma case where the facial nerve, the internal auditory meatus lay open. The patient was completely deaf and they collected gold wires to the uh, cochlear nerve and the patient could hear sound. They actually published this, but then they had some difference of opinion and the project was dropped till this man, uh, Shua, took it up on the work of uh, Journo and Eris and in 1985 developed this Torimac French implant. But at the same time in the United States, Simmons in 64 and more importantly House and Doyle in the 70s developed this implant for bilateral profound deafness and this 3M implant was actually used for a few years, commercially available, but the problem was this was used only in postlingual deafness and there were issues about um, you know efficacy and safety because it was a single electrode it stimulated only one locus in the cochlea. Therefore, any frequency coming in could be heard only by stimulation of one area in the cochlea. So it was a monotone, so gave no speech discrimination. My own experience in cochlear implants, 1979, near Cologne, a small village called Duran, Professor Banfai was using this seven electrode extra cochlear implant. It was the size of my fingernail. There were these electrodes on a flat plate and he would open expose the cochlea, dig seven holes. I saw, him, I saw him perform this surgery. I was quite, quite disturbed and horrified at what he was trying to do because the cochlea promontory is convex and he was trying to fit this flat implant onto the convex thing. It was almost like putting a, a square peg in a round hole and this is, he struggled and then finally managed to shove it in some or the other. And I said, I'm never going to do cochlear implants, but we've come a long way. Professor Clark developed a 10 channel implant. Uh, this is Rod Saunders, the first patient. This was the chip that was used and this chip was put in a computer which was the size of a room. The patient after operation had to come in, had to be plugged to the computer and this was not commercially viable. So they worked on this processor, came down to a transistor radio side and subsequently multi-channel implants became the order of the day and uh, uh, multiple uh, Processing strategies were developed so that the results from starting with uh, what 12 percent speech discrimination have come up to more than 80, 85 percent speech discrimination. And the size of the chip has come down so much that this can be the implant that you see today. And this is 
the cordless wireless implant from uh, nucleus. So this is what the whole thing has come down to. Now, an implant is only going to work if you choose the right candidate. As I told you, initially, cochlear implants were meant for adults. When they thought of doing it in children in the late 80s, people said the, the prominent autologists of those days said it's never going to be possible. It will never work in children. But we know that people stuck to it and result has been remarkable. So basically, you have to have a patient. This is postlingual adults. You have bilateral profound or severe to profound loss postlingual. That means they have speech and language. No or very little benefit from a hearing aid and there is no other contraindication. The patient should have a support system for mapping and AVT. Psychologically should be properly motivated and they should have access to repairs and uh, replacement if required. Over a period of time with the improvement of results, we said profound deafness, severe deafness with less than speech discrimination score of 30%. Today we say less than 50%. And uh, you say that with a cochlear implant, you can get the results comparable to hearing aid users with average hearing levels of about 66 dB. Now, in children who are prelingual or perilingual, born at or very, very soon after birth, if they become deaf, we started off with age of two to four years. Rest of criteria were the same bilateral profound loss, no benefit from a hearing aid. But today we've come down to an age which is under 12 months. We even operate at seven and eight months of age and go up to four to eight years. So let's see how the indications have changed. This is what we started with. Absolutely nothing, even a hearing aid gave no response. Then we had this where the hearing aid could bring them up, but they were still outside the speech banana, so the speech discrimination was poor. Sometimes you have very good low frequencies, what you call a ski slow. But the high frequencies is what you require speech discrimination. So these patients can have some understanding, will hear sound, even without a hearing aid, but they cannot understand what's being said. Because the low frequencies, 250, 500 are important for your voice or vowels. The consonants come from the higher frequencies. And I'll show you how these consonants are important. For example, if I were to have this patient and I give him this nursery rhyme, he would only get the vowels, he would not get the consonants. And I asked you, can you tell me what nursery rhyme this is? Very difficult. But if I give you consonants and I don't give you the vowels, you can immediately make out what the nursery rhyme is. So this is the importance of having high frequency sound. So just having good low frequency is not good enough. So then we said you have one year which is aidable, the other year not. We can now operate in the deaf ear and put in a cochlear implant. And today we say that if you have one year normal and the other year not aidable, these are classical patients that we see with sudden sensory neural hearing loss who don't respond. We used to advise them Baha, which I'm sure Sunil will talk about, but today we also give them cochlear implants and they're doing very well. Now remember that hearing begins even before you're born. The child learns the mother's voice before the child is born. And in the first two years of life, the development takes place in the auditory cortex where the synapses start to open up in response to sound. Here, even one month before month, before birth, the synapses have started to develop. And as you can see, as the child grows older, by two years, you get the maximum fertility that I would use the word for the synapses to open up. But that requires sound stimulation. Now, if there is no sound stimulation, then over a period of years, the capacity of these synapses to open up becomes less and less. And therefore, the ideal thing is operate before the age of two years so that the auditory cortex has the capacity to make maximum use of the implant. So... If you don't do that, what's going to happen is the auditory cortex, which is lying silent, will be taken over by the surrounding cortices, such as the visual cortex. They'll become lip readers, sign language, and you'll have lost the auditory cortex. So the message is very clear for the auditory cortex. Either you use it or you lose it. So ideally, you should do an implant before the age of three years. Three to six years, you can still expect a fairly decent result. But after that, the outcome becomes variable and you can't make promises to the parents. Which means we have to, as a group, work towards universal newborn screening. And it's not just the job of the ENT to do that. It's the ENT, the pediatrician, the obsgyne, the audiologists, the deaf school teachers, 
and they can't do it on their own if you have to spread awareness and make people understand that it is important to test your child's hearing even though the child appears to be apparently normal you'll have to take the help of the primary health centers anganwadi tv radio print media movie theaters road shows and uh, create awareness so that a child who's born deaf is getting an early intervention and therefore can have optimum results so we have to work towards universal newborn screening now once you've got the indication from the audiological point of view you do a ct scan to see you have a good mastoid you have a good cochlea there is nothing wrong with the uh turns of the cochlea you have a good internal auditory meatus you do an mri to see that the cochlea is fluid filled and the cochlear nerves are present so that you know that you are going to get a good outcome of course you get several cochlear malformations here is a list we are not going to discuss that today but try and understand that the first three labyrinthine aplasia rudimentary autocyst and cochlear aplasia these are cases where you cannot think of doing an implant but the other ones except for hypoplasia 1 and 2 where the cochlea is very small all the others even a common cavity and incomplete partitions can give you fairly decent results and can be operated so now you've got audiology radiology you have a pediatrician check the child to make sure there are no other defects that will come in your way no other syndromes and they also give a vaccination protocol usually hemophilus and uh, pneumococcal vaccines wait for a month and then you're ready to operate nowadays in this implant uh, in the covid uh, pandemic this is how we operate we put a complete tent of plastic around the patient you put your hands through two holes in the plastic so that when you drill none of the aerosol generated is coming to you or the patient or to the uh, people in the theater i'm going to very quickly run through the steps you take a template where the processor is going to come you take a needle and with a needle with methylene blue mark a deep point onto the bone so you know where to place your implant uh, in the bed so you know where to make the bed post oral incision like a tympanoplasty periosteal flap elevated create a tunnel to house the implant put a dummy to see that your tunnel is wide enough and we've developed this uh, little uh, retractor so even with this small incision what i have done is i've sort of put teeth on it so that you go under the periosteum and you can bowstring it pull it so that you have access to the area where you want to drill for the well so you can drill the well is a little bony island if you have to go down to the dura you can measure that the size of the well is okay and then you drill holes for tying down the implant drill a channel that's a little open ended tunnel that we make so that we can put the implant afterwards under this and then you turn your attention to the mastoidectomy cortical mastoidectomy done incus identified do the posterior tympanotomy and the landmarks of the posterior tympanotomy is the base of the triangular fossa incudis identify the facial nerve called a tympani and you open the middle ear you're able to see the round window you're ready to put in the implant if you don't see the round window too well you can remove this bone over here operculum and get a good view of the round window so you can do a round window insertion if required now before you open the round window put in the implant secure it in place put in the ground electrode and now you open the round window or the cochleostomy as some people might want to do it do it very gently so you don't get a uh effect of stirring the cochlear fluids and then you're ready to put the implant this is an ip2 patient so there is a slight leak of csf that's no problem handle the implant gently it's going in through the uh, cochleostomy very gently very slowly and then you have to seal this leak in ip1 ip3 and common cavities you might get a gusher you wait till the leak becomes a little less and seal it on the table as well as you can you should not allow the csf to leak by you know seal it before you close and then you put the array into the cavity and push it under that hook so it doesn't bounce out take a couple of stitches and now we are ready before closure to test there is another you know there are different kinds of implants here for example you have a atraumatic one this is a contour advance so when you're putting it inside there is a white mark on this so when you go up to the white mark you go into the cochlea only up to here you don't go and rub along the outer wall which can damage the elements there you go in till you see this white mark over here you've gone in through the cochleostomy you've come up to here 
Now there is a stillet, and like you take your socks off your leg, you hold the stillet and you push the implant off the stillet. That's the stillet here. The idea is to make the insertion as atraumatic as possible to the cochlea to preserve whatever structures are intact in the cochlea without damaging. So you're holding the stillet and as you start pushing, you will see what is happening over here. This is how the implant comes off and goes around without rubbing on the outer wall and destroying any structures there. Then once you've got the implant in, close the wound, you can do a image intensifier to check the implant is correctly and then we do a neural response telemetry. You check the impedances that are okay. You check all the electrodes giving you proper responses from the nerve and you know that you've done your job well. We insist on doing this in every case before closing. Also at times you can look for the stapedial reflex. Look at this part here. It, you can see it moving. Once again, I'll show it to you. Give electrical stimulation. Look here. There, you see the stapedius contracting, you know that your implant is functional. Tight closure, the implant is completely covered and nothing is exposed. The mastoid is covered with periosteum, the wound is closed. Patient goes on the same evening or the next day. Now, once the wound is healed, post-operative mapping is done and then it's AVT, AVT, AVT. These are the people you need without AVT, your implant program is useless. So before you start operating, have the AVT program in place. This was my first team that helped me start the program at Hinduja. And they are the ones who nurture that seed that you've put in over the next two or three years. And they are the gardeners who make that fruit or flower come to life. Without that, your program is useless. Hi, my name is Kohu. Uh, I was operated on when I was one year old. And uh, I have a cochlear implant. And uh, I am now studying in ninth grade in Trada school. And I want to be. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a writer uh, when I grow up. Writer for the movies? Or this girl was operated when she was one year old. You've seen the result. But cochlear implant is not just about hearing and language and speech. Yes, that's very important. But cochlear implant is also about the brain because hearing is brain and hearing loss has to be treated as an emergency with the earliest intervention possible to give that child the best chance of development, not just for language and speech, but also general and brain development. Because the auditory system is connected to the cognitive function. And if you lose out on the auditory system, memory, comprehension, and a variety of tasks that depend on proper functioning of the cognitive system will suffer. Multitasking, which is a part of life, will suffer. These children will not be able to compete with other children if you don't have their hearing because they are not able to multitask. Their self-esteem is poorer. It's surprising that self-esteem with cochlear implanted children is better than the self-esteem of children with hearing aids. Symptoms of psychopathology are more common in deaf children and deaf adults. Poor self-confidence, poor self-esteem, depression, social anxiety, etc. And even in adults, loss of job, therefore isolation, depression, paranoia. And note, earlier onset of dementia. No surgery is free of complications and cochlear implant is no different. You grade them as minor or major complications. Minor complications can be taken care of without much trouble, but major complications are something to be worried about. And these are CSF leak. Therefore, if there is infection, meningitis, facial paralysis. Hematomas, abscesses, wound infection, which might require surgical intervention or even explantation. Skin necrosis and exposure of the implant. Malpositioned areas that we've had many coming to us with this. And facial nerve stimulation because of the uh, pathology in the cochlea. Device damage during uh, insertion or device failure at a later date, which requires a revision surgery. So here we have uh, a bad wound, the migration of the implant, abscess formation, uh, facial nerve stimulation. Here we have, this was a patient who came to me where the implant still gave me good impedances, but this is how the implant was hanging. And we had to take it out and put a new implant inside. Malposition arrays, and that is why I feel that people who do implants need to train themselves adequately. You know, we had started our program at Hinduja with the hub and spoke model. I was dealing with audiology centers from all over India, but it was very difficult for these patients to travel from there 
Traveling to Bombay is not easy. Finding accommodation in Bombay is not easy. So you can't expect them to keep on coming for mapping and therapy. So we decided if, you know, the uh, mountain does not come to Muhammad, then Muhammad has to go to the mountain. So we started training people. You can recognize many of the faces here. That these were patients, or these were surgeons. I trained and then mentored by actually going and standing with them when they did their first implants. Just two days ago, Dr. Sangeeta demonstrated now at the ISO a cochlear implant. Fantastic demonstration. So not only training, but also mentoring because I knew how difficult it was for me when I started. No mentor, no training, nobody to turn to. Had to do it on a cadaver temporal bone one day before surgery. Take it to the hospital, see that my implant was properly placed and then do it in the theater by myself. So I said, now we must start training, cadaver dissection courses, lecture courses, live surgery demonstrations, didactic lectures. And we also started a fellowship program where I have fellows coming, staying with me for three to six months. And my promise to them is I'll mentor them when they start. This I'm doing now through a foundation that we've started called the I Hear Foundation. And we have these fellowships and workshops going on every year. And when I say mentor, it's a hands-on mentorship where I will wash up and be with the person till such time and as many visits as required, whether it's been in Bombay, where it was KM, Nair, Sion, railway hospitals, many of the private hospitals, I will be physically present with you till I know that you're capable of doing it myself. And in spite of having done it for 25 or 27 surgeons in my city alone, and for about 60 to 70 surgeons all over India, believe me, the OPD attendance in my hospital hasn't gone down. And this is a message to all the cochlear implant surgeons. Train people around you. Don't have a dog in the manger attitude because your work will not decrease. There are 1.5 million patients waiting there for cochlear implant. But the biggest problem was money. Most of these patients coming to us, and I'm sure to many of you, are poor, cannot afford, and they want to entrust their life to you, the child's life to you. His whole future is in your hand. Remember, a patient is entrusting his quality of life as his survival to the surgeon. And certification by university does not imply competence in the operation theater. Just to say, well, I am MSCNT, so how can I not be allowed to do a cochlear implant? There were people who complained that way. I think it behoves the surgeon who wants to do an implant to have proper training. There is no body that can control you. If you just want to pick up an implant and put it, nobody can stop you. The CE, the Cochlear Implant Group of India, has given beautiful guidelines. But they're only guidelines. They're trying to tell you, listen, if you want to do a program, follow these guidelines, train yourself. Unfortunately, the body is, you know, without teeth because it cannot enforce this into somebody. Somebody wants to say, no, I still want to do it myself. Fine, you can do it. But the CE has given guidelines, so follow them and train yourself well before you start doing implants rather than trying to find shortcuts. You know, trying to put an implant by doing just a blind tunnel. It's a horrible thing for me to see a cutting burr being blindly pushed somewhere. And I, Dr. Dubey, who's been advocating this now, I have managed to convince him that you can do the same thing if you don't want to do a posterior tympanotomy, which is 99.9% .9 of the world surgeons are doing. Instead of doing this blindly by this technique, we describe what we call not the varia, but the Mumbai technique. And they said varia technique is minimally invasive. Look at this scar. And look at this with the posterior tympanotomy and you decide which is minimally invasive. But we said, okay, if you don't want to do a posterior tympanotomy, at least see one thing. When you do a varia, this is where you enter blindly. Instead of that, if you do a cortical macerator, and you'll agree with me that a person wanting to do a cochlear implant should be able to do a cortical macerectomy. This spot, the fossa incud is here. You always have space. So you can always enter from there in total safety under direct vision, and this is how we advocate you can do the surgery. You take a post-oral incision, elevate the posterior canal wall intact. Do not take a cut, so you're not exposing it to an unsterile area of the external canal. You can drill away the posterior canal overhang and expose the round window. Then you go to the fossa incudis, slightly enlarge it, that's it. And now you can put an implant in from there, visualize from the middle ear side, no cut. You can just push the skin ahead and you can put the implant from here. Don't try to grab it with the forceps. Use a claw and feed it into the cochleostomy or the round window and push it inside. So this way you're doing it under vision without that blindly pushing a 
implant inside through that uh, tunnel. But even then, I say no. Do the routine operation which is done by the rest of the world, posterior tympanotomy, and uh, make sure that you have your AVT program in place to make sure that all the centers that I deal with from all over India through the IR Foundation, we also do uh, update for audiologists once a year. And this is the group that I get together. These are the audiologists and therapists that I work with. This is my family and we have patients coming from them. They send the patients back to them. But with the help of these workshops, we ensure that wherever they are, they are up with the latest technology that is required. Now the cost. It's really expensive. People who, who cannot afford it are going to be in trouble. And we were the first to start donations from corporates. So initially our graph was very slow, but today over the past 25 years, we managed to cross 3000. For these patients, we got donations. This was 2003 for the first time, the corporates, Mr. Mahindra, we got donations for these children. Then when before the government programs came in, we approached several governments and had free implants, courtesy the chief minister there. And then with the IHER Foundation, we are now collecting donations from various donors and we are funding surgeries of uh, several hundred patients a year. Today, I'm very happy to say that the federal state governments and even the ADIP scheme from the central government, over 10 to 12,000 patients have already got operated. So many centers, more than 230, 250 centers have been empowered all over the country to do cochlear implant surgery. So this is really something great. The poor can now get a cochlear implant at no cost. But remember, you've given them an implant, but things can go bad because even post implant, a lot of money is required for mapping, for therapy, for traveling, batteries, wires get broken. And if the person who gets an implant is so poor that he cannot afford this, then a person who's got an implant over a period of time may become a non-user. There are certain government schemes where even the post-operative mapping therapy charges are taken care of, but this is a lifelong expense. So after the two years are over, if they can't spend money to carry on, they may become non-users because of the funding. Along with the implant centers and surgeons, I don't think we've done capacity building by increasing diagnostic centers, lowering the cost of hearing aids, which are still expensive, audiology centers and auditory verbal therapy. We are overloading the centers which are already there with the increased number of patients coming in. And that can only mean difficulty. You can imagine a scene like this at auditory verbal center therapy. And we also have surgeons putting in implants right, left and center. And we've seen some of these examples, many more of them where the implants are put in places where they do not belong. Semicircular canal, internal auditory med, through and through the cochlea. Add to this the problem of the price war that has started because of government tenders. Companies are willing to sell implants almost at half the cost of what they start with in the general market. But price war and lowering the price by so much means the company is not going to be able to give support services, which comes out of the profits that they make. And you're going to have a lot of government operated patients not getting services when they require. Another problem, pro products get outdated. This is now gone out of fashion and patients who got this on free government schemes have to now buy a new implant and pay two and a half to three lakhs to get it. They don't have the money. This can no longer be repaired. So it's such a sad thing, a child who's hearing, going to a normal school, implant stops working and now doesn't have the money to upgrade. So I think as surgeons, if you're going to operate on these patients, we have to take care of this. And we are taking and helping patients with this burden through our high year foundation, even to upgrade the implants of the patients that we have operated. So the government schemes are great, but because of course, remember, we might have more and more dropouts as the time goes by. Now I'm just come to talk about what the future holds for us. But before I go there, there are some things which I'm going to mention, some not very pleasant, and please bear with me because I feel very strongly about them. This is not aimed at anybody, but these are facts of life. Listen to this man. You know, every time the misguiders started from the beginning, even if we, we, we showed to a pediatrician, they said, the pediatrician is saying that when he was a five years old, he started speaking. She is okay, she can speak, do this, everything, no problem for her. So he said, no problem. 
When we shown her in a good hospital in Bahrain, the doctor said she is having a wax. They removed the wax. They said everything is okay. I said if everything is okay, then when I speak, why she is not able to tell me anything? You know. So. I think it behoves every doctor, every ENT doctor to whom the patient comes for proper counselling. There should be no misinformation. I'm sorry, but we get patients who are told, look, this cochlear implant, you know, it's not going to work. It's a brain surgery. There may be damage to the brain, all sorts of things. I mean, if you're not a, a program, uh, cochlear implant uh, program holder, it doesn't mean this misinformation and just giving hearing aids to the patient is really what you have to do. Because remember, by misinforming the patient, not giving him the correct perspective, and just harping on hearing aids and hearing aids for obvious reasons. And this is happening all over the place, I can tell you. You are really taking away from the child the opportunity that the child has. And by the time they realize that they were taken for a ride and they come for support, the child is seven, eight years old and has lost the opportunity of a fantastic reason that could have been there. So please, no harping on hearing aids when you know they're not going to work. Give honest inputs to the parents so that they can have the implant done when it is necessary. The other thing that upsets me, we get patients who've gone to other centers and they want to come and have surgery with me. I'm sure my patients are going elsewhere also. And when we say, okay, you want surgery, please get your CT scan and MRI done. Oh, we've got it done. Where is it? The previous center that we've got, the surgeon is holding them and not giving them back to us. There's a dog, dog in the manger attitude. You do that so that the patient cannot go anywhere else and Patient has paid for the investigation. It's the patient's right to decide where to go. For heaven's sake, do not do this to the patient. Do not take this attitude. Leave the parents have the choice where they want to get the child operated. And lastly, misuse of donation. You know, I had a patient who came to me. I gave donations, got one side operated. The mother came back saying, I want the other side. I said, look, my donors will give it for one side. If they have money for another implant, they'll give it to a child who's bilaterally deaf. You already have an implant on one side. She went to another center, got the operation done on a donation, and she had the audacity to come back and throw the paper in my face and say, you said it couldn't be done. I did it. What they did was they showed the old investigations to the donor, did not tell the donor that one side was operated and got it done. I think you are misusing the trust that the donor puts in you. Don't do that. And the other thing is, I had this call just very recently. I'm getting a donation. I'm getting six lakhs, so five and a half lakhs as a donor. I will put in the remaining nine lakhs and I want the top. I said, look, if you are poor, you get a donation. If you can afford to put in the nine lakhs, why should you take? And I know that there are people who are doing this. I have had complaints that my, you know, people who have referred patients to me and I have refused to done that, have gone to certain centers and got it done, that you take a donation for a certain amount saying that the patient is poor. Then the patient puts in almost twice the amount and does the higher end implant. Look, the donors are giving you, trusting the doctors not to do this. So for heaven's sake, do not misuse the trust of the donors. One more thing is adult implants. 95% of all the people operated in India are pediatric patients because of the donations. We have a huge population of adults and to all the ENT surgeons I say, these are people who are active in life. They might be 65, 70, 80 years old, but the hearing aids are not helping because the deafness is severe to profound. These are candidates and you can advise them regarding implants. In all the developed countries, they are doing more adult implants than pediatric implants. So this is my plea. For the donors, keep trust, do not misuse their trust, do not withhold investigations and give proper counseling to patients. Now, this is where the future is going. We are operating on more and more patients with hearing, so we have to do surgery that preserves hearing. So you've got beautifully delicate implants which need posterior tympanotomy to insert to learn to do the posterior tympanotomy. You cannot put these through the blind tunnels. Hybrid where you have the lower frequency is good, so you use the lower frequencies auditory and the high frequencies with electrical stimulation, but that's already there. The totally implantable cochlear implant is already in existence, but right now not commercially available, but I'm sure it will come. It's still under experiments. Brainstem implants are very much available, so it's no longer future, but putting implants higher up in the brain, say inferior colliculus, people are working on it. Using neurotropic factors to inject into the cochlea or have drug eluding implant so that steroids or neurotropic factors could go in with the implant so that the uh, neural elements are better preserved is already very much on the cards. 
people are trying to use robotic surgery to make the insertion of the implant as atraumatic as possible to again preserve hearing. Let's talk about gene therapy and stem cells. These are the latest implants which are extremely delicate. This is the brain stem implant when you don't have a cochlear nerve, the cochlear is, nerve is damaged by a tumor and this is very much in vogue right now. You can see the implant through the foramen lushka onto the cochlear nucleus. Neurotropic factors for better preservation, robotic surgery and now we come to gene therapy. Already the University of Michigan had done this and they deafened uh, guinea pigs then they used the 801 gene using a viral vector, they put it, and within two months, the hair cells had generated. And the guinea pig could hear again. Stem cells is the other one which is developing a pluripotent cells which can differentiate it into any specialized cell. Unfortunately, in cochlea, neither embryonal stem cells nor adult stem cells are present. People have worked on mice, cochlea, etc., by putting stem cells inside, but in humans, no stem cells are available for commercial use at the moment. Genetic engineering, there are trials going on. There is a trial going on in UK, Germany and France called REGAIN trial, where they've got patients with mild to moderate sensory neural deafness. Now, what happens is usually in these uh, birds who become deaf, the supporting cells of the cochlea regenerate into damaged hair cells. So the damaged hair cells go away and the supporting cells automatically become hair cells. So if you take a bird, give it gentamicin and deafen it, within a few months it will develop fresh new hair cells and will start hearing again. So this is what this trial is trying to do. The doctors are putting substances into the middle ear hoping that it will go through the round window membrane into the cochlea. And uh, you have this uh, notch pathway the notch pathway is something like a policeman that prevents the damaged cells being replaced by supporting cells. Okay, So to give you a diagrammatic representation, this is the guy, the notch pathway, which is going to prevent these supporting cells when the hair cells get destroyed and is not allowing them to develop. So what this group from UK, Germany and Greece are doing now is that they are using a substance which is called a gamma secretase inhibitor. They inject it into the ear and hope that it diffuses through the round window membrane and knocks off that notch pathway there. That policeman is removed and new hair cells will generate. This trial is three years old and we are waiting to see its outcome. But what is more eagerly awaited is an Indian cochlear implant. The cochlear implant costs about you know, 9,200 9, US dollars today. And this man, APJ Kalam sir, Dr. APJ Kalam, our past president, thought why not develop an Indian implant, which I'm told is very much there. Uh, Dr. Venkatesh from the armed forces is supervising a team of doctors looking into it. Dr. Sunil that also is very much on the team. And I think they are already at the stage of human trials. So we wish them success and hope that sooner or later this will come at one fourth the cost and many more people can avail of this implant. So this is really for me what the future holds for us in India. Now, there are various uh, awards and you know feelings that you get uh, doing cochlear implants. Of course, this was a big moment in my life and I got this cochlear hero award from none other than uh, Professor Clark, when we crossed the 2,500 implant mark, this is in his office in uh, Melbourne, one of the proudest moments of my life being given this by this man. But what is even more heartwarming for me than this award? My name is Adit Bhavani. I am going to Anuman Chalisa and acting. Just watch the parents' face. Look at their involvement. Anjani Putra Pavan Asuta Nama Ma Ved Vekram Bajarangi Kumati Nivar Sumati Kesangi Kanchana Barana Virasu Beza Kanana Kundana Kunchita Kesa Adaraja Dajabira it's not only the child's life that you've chosen, given him a bright future, but the entire family becomes happy with this. And this 
is is more a reward than anything else in the world the smile on that face and the bright future for that child however if the uk germany and greece doctors succeed in knocking this fellow off and regenerating the hair cells we cochlear implant surgeons will be out of business there no more surgery will be required it will be only with an injection that you will be able to restore hearing in these patients so then what are we going to do i have decided what i want to do farming thank you thank you very much for a patient listening and i think i have finished in time and happy to take any questions if there are any thank you sir thank you sir there's one question sir can you hear me yep so there's one question from dr shenal of Dr. of university his question is what are the guidelines for bilateral implantation yeah shenal nice of you to join in shenal incidentally is one of my cochlear fellows and mentees i think she's done more than 500 implants on her own in indore so she's a real uh, versatile cochlear implant surgeon well if you have bilateral hearing loss and uh, both sides are implantable the ideal utopic situation would be to do a bilateral implant either at the same time or if funds do not permit it uh, you can do it sequentially because two is always going to be better than one so whenever feasible possible and economically possible then bilateral implants would be the order of the day so there is one more question from dr meena kale of mumbai what are the criteria for reimplantation uh reimplantation would occur under various circumstances one is where uh, let's say you you find that the implant that was working for some time for some reason just stops working this is what you call a hard failure where for some reason the implant stops working there were crystal box tests and the company tells you that look nothing the implant has just gone dead in which case you would replace it or if you have a soft failure wherein the implant progressively starts losing performance for whatever reason and then you have to switch off a few electrodes and the performance drops you may have to uh, replace it if the implant is giving poor performance and you do an x-ray and find that the implant has not been properly introduced you will have to replace it or if the implant gets damaged due to trauma you may have to replace it lastly if there is infection and the wound does not heal the implant gets exposed and all your attempts to treat that infection fail then the implant usually has that biofilm on it and you'll have to remove the implant wait for the wound to heal and uh, replace the implant yeah. okay thank you sir thank you for a very interesting lecture so there are no more questions at the moment so i really realized where i was lacking in this implantation program and which what i have to do more thank okay you. all the best to you thank you sir you've got samir working with you at cooper so you have a mentor ready in place already for you yes, i'm going to take his help in doing this further few surgery sir learn further okay. surgery okay okay take okay care. thank you sir right oh. so samir now can i uh... yes sir thank you very much for that uh, really complete 360 perspective of the and thank you very much sir for telling out the history because that is something that you know uh, not many people know and it's very important to know history so that you can learn from the experiences of uh, the very great people who you know gone into the depths earlier and uh, so and more important i finished in time <laughs> <laughs> so we if we get some questions that we will revert back to you uh, yeah. so in the meantime we can then proceed for the second lecture can you can you excuse me Yeah. Yes. Uh, There's one more question from Dr. Prakash Munka of Bokaro Steel City. For sir, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. The question is: Any age limit for elderly people for cochlear implantation and duration of deafness? Does it matter? Uh, there is no age limit uh, in the elderly. It depends upon the physical and mental fitness of the patient and the. is desire really to have you can't force it on him but people have operated of patients in their late 90s even okay so if they are physically and mentally fit and if they require the implant it can be done 
the duration of deafness is an issue um, the lesser the duration of deafness the better the outcome so i think we have to be reasonable if i get a patient who's 80 years old and says he became deaf when he was 20 years old i probably wouldn't do it but if it's within um, how shall i put it very rough guess if it's uh, less than half the age of the patient so if you have a 40 year patient and the deafness is less than uh, 20 years i think i would go for it yeah it's a very uh, i mean i would prefer to do it as soon as the deafness is detected and you know that it's not recovering and hearing it is not working the longer you wait uh, the poorer the results likely to be so what about the youngest so in in australia they are implanting at three and a half four months also so what yeah, is uh, you know something the the worry here is anesthesia blood loss and the skin and i think uh, i've sp spoken to a lot of surgeons they say that uh, we they are operating around the age of one i have operated bilateral implants at the age of eight months i don't think at this point of time there is going to be a very great advantage operating at four or five as compared to operating at eight or nine and ultimately the auditory verbal therapy is really not going to begin so you have to strike a balance between the increased uh, risk factor when going in very young from the point of view of the skin the blood loss the anesthesia and really how much are you gaining by going that year so i still feel that if i had a four or five year old patient i would wait till about eight or nine ten ten months and uh, then probably go right uh, thank you very much. One sir. more question. Okay, there are some more questions, sir. Okay, Maybe we've got a few minutes, minutes to go. Maybe two, three minutes to go. Yeah. So, so let me you want, so This is from Doctor Anip. I can't hear you, Nina. You're muted. Nina, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Okay. Hello. Yeah. The question is indication for cochlear implant in unilateral hearing loss. That's what I said, that we were advising Baha, but now there is enough evidence to show that if you have one side normal and one side deaf and say a sudden sensitive hearing loss or whatever the cause, uh, you can implant. They take about six months or a year to balance out the two years, but they're getting amazingly good results. If you can implant the same year where you have auditory and electrical stimulation in the same year and the brain accepts that, then having two different uh, stimulations, auditory in one year and electrical in the other, uh, can work. And it is now evidently shown with proper evidence that it is good. So you have, you can give the patient choice of Baha or uh, cochlear implant. What is the other question? Hello. Yeah. So another question from Dr. Abba of Delhi. With unilateral hearing loss, natural sound of one side and sound of implant on the other side. Yeah, it's different. And uh, the brain learns to balance it out. As a matter of fact, Nidhant, I think this, let's keep this as last question because Sunil has to start. You know, okay. when we had patients with hearing loss on both sides, they were using hearing aids, not helping very much. We operated on the worse ear. And we told them, now you, you've got this hearing because of the cochlear implant, you need not wear a hearing aid on the other side. And they came back and said, we use the cochlear implant, but when we use the hearing aid on the other side, the cochlear implant seems to give us better results. So they told us that having hearing aid on one side and cochlear implant on the other is better than using only the cochlear implant. So they themselves felt that having two different stimulations, the brain got adjusted to it. And today, I think there are enough publications to show that this different stimulation, which was our worry initially, the brain has got enough plasticity to adjust to it and the patients do very well. So that initial worry is no longer there. Okay, Sunil, yeah. you're on. I think my time is up. Thank and you, Nina, sir. Any more? Question, Beg your pardon? So that was the last question. Great. So, so Sunil can start Dr. bang on time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Once again. Thank you, sir. It was nice talk. Thank you. And uh, so, for the second speaker for the evening, uh, the uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Anil Kumar Harugop. Uh, Dr. Anil Kumar is the professor and head of department at the JN Medical College, Belgaum. He's also a PhD from the Kaili University, Belgaum. 
He has been the secretary of the Karnataka State Chapter for the year 2011 and 12, a member of the editorial board of the National AOI 2018 and 2019. He has several publications in international and national journals and has been for the uh, Indian Journal uh, uh, of uh, Ecology as well. Uh, he has, uh, to his credit, the the King Sir Senior Consultant uh, Award uh, at the Asia Oceanic Conference at Hyderabad. So, may I request Dr. Anil Harugup to uh, come on and introduce our next speaker for the evening, Dr. Sunil Narayanan. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Sunil Narayanan Dutt. He is not only MS and DNV. He is double FRCS from Edinburgh and uh, uh, Netherlands. Uh, he is the founder, uh, secretary, and current president of uh, Global Cochlear Implant Access Network. Current president, Cochlear Implant Group of India. He is the current president of Cochlear Implant of India. And he is the uh, right now working as a professor and a distinguished clinical tutor, senior consultant and a clinical director in Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Cancer, uh, head, uh, head of the Cochlear Implant Program, Apollo Karnataka Region, Apollo International uh, Hospitals, Banirgata Road, Bangalore. So, with this few introduction, I uh, request Dr. Professor Sunil Narayan Dutt to go ahead with this talk. Thank you, sir. Okay. Excellent. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Yeah, so you see my uh, title slide clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see it. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anil, for that uh, kind uh, introduction. And uh, let me also at the outset express my gratitude uh, uh, to Team AOI, specifically my dear friend Samir, uh, Bharti Ma'am, Kaushal, and uh, Yogesh. And of course, Anil and uh, Ninad. Very happy to be sharing a screen space, as I call it, with my guru. Uh, like Samir said, he's the guru of all gurus. And it, I'm so pleased to be sharing it with uh, Dr. Kirtanay. Uh, my remit uh, today, ladies and gentlemen, is to speak on hearing implants other than cochlear implants in India. Uh, what have we done and where are we today and what will be the future? I have also lately made it my mandate to recognize, to acknowledge all my teachers um, for it is, like Dr. Tirtanay himself said, it is uh, because we are able to sit or even stand on the shoulders of these giants, we are able to see further and farther. So, recognizing Ravi Nair, Milin Kirtane, Mohan Kameshwaran, David Proops, Richard Irving, John Rutka. The, the structure of my talk uh, in the next, uh, hopefully, 40, 45 minutes would be like so. We'll just uh, have an insight on implantation autology. Let's look at classifications of bone conduction devices. I think the world has uh, the, probably the best experience with bone conduction devices, specifically Baha. So let's uh, talk about Baha, the current status and practice. Let's briefly touch upon bone conduction implants, the others, and then quickly dwell on middle ear implantable hearing devices, uh, specifically on the vibrant sound bridge, where, which probably has by far the best uh, experience. Let's look at the Indian experience with all these devices. And then I have a couple of uh, videos 
the steps of Baha attract surgery and then the steps of bone bridge uh, surgery. I think it's worth uh, going through these two. And, uh, and, and a brief uh, insight on auditory brainstem implantation and thanks to Dr. Mohan for sharing his slides there. And I will uh, conclude with some take home uh, thoughts. Implantation autology for, for the juniors in the audience is that branch of autology where hearing implants are surgically implanted for hearing habilitation or rehabilitation. So habilitation is when the patients had never had a hearing experience. So those with congenital deafness would get habilitated with these hearing implants and those with postlingual deafness would get rehabilitated. Implantation autology does not include hearing restoration surgeries such as tepidotomies, tympanoplasties and oscular reconstructions which are trying to repair uh, an abnormal uh, physiology and making them normal physiology. So those are, those are not part of implantation autology, they're part of autology. So, so, so what uh, implantation autology includes is cochlear implants, bone and conduction implants, middle ear implantable hearing devices, auditory brainstem implants, and can we extend this to include midbrain implants and even vestibular implants. So, so maybe this is uh, not just hearing implants, hearing and vestibular implants, because vestibular implants also have a cochlear implant component with them. I don't think I have time to cover that. We are pressed for time, but uh, there's a thought. So here's a point to ponder. There is no contesting the fact that the impact of profound deafness is profound. And Dr. Kitane has very lucidly, you know, elucidated this, this point of profound deafness and how it's impacted beautifully taken through that journey of his. Every time I listen to him, you know, it just makes you speechless. There, there is that dumbfoundment that you get, uh, pun intended, we're dealing with deafness. Uh, so globally, because of this, there have been nearly eight, uh, eight to nine lakhs. I, I would say nine lakh implants, not a million yet, but it, it would get there. But then there are about 15 to 20 million under fives with congenital deafness and profound loss who could be benefiting. So we're still not doing well. In India, like Sir said, there are about three million, nearly three million under five children who can be implanted and we have, this is a guesstimate, we have probably reached the 40,000 mark in the past two decades. But most of these has been in the past decade, thanks to the government programs and the national program on, uh, you know, with the ADIP scheme. So I don't want to go into cochlear implants any more than Sir has uh, dealt with. So needless to, uh, say the impact of partial deafness is only partial because, because the handicap that is perceived is smaller, the social handicap, the educational handicap is smaller. And at the moment, the costs outweigh the benefits. They're very expensive for, for the perceived benefit. Only, you know, someone else can say this, but the person suffering it will view it differently. If only they could afford it, they would definitely go for it. And also the awareness is lacking. The incidence, God only knows. GOK stands for God only knows. And then really, world over, we don't really know the incidence of partial deafness. We can uh, talk about that a little later. So let's go on to bone conduction devices. Now, I've had this simple classification that I always... Uh, Refer to this is a very surgical, practical kind of uh, clinical classification. So you have non-surgical bone conduction devices and surgical bone conduction devices. Non-surgical include uh, all that listed there, and we could discuss some of them. For example, there's Adhere here, which is uh, a metal uh, device, which is glue based, and, and it just conducts uh, sound from this processor directly onto onto bone through skin, of course, and, and that adhesive uh, strip needs to be changed uh, twice a week or so. And you could be using it throughout the wakeful period. So that's the ad here. 
which has come uh, recently to India also, and we've had a few patients using it. Then there are surgical bone conduction devices, which can be percutaneous bone conduction devices, which was the first generation, and then transcutaneous BCBs. Percutaneous includes the Baha, the Baha Connect, and then the Oticon Ponto. We'll look at them uh, in detail. So the non-surgical BCDs I was giving you examples of, there's the Baha Softband, the Baha Sound Art, the medal ad here, I showed you the slide. Then you have the traditional uh, bone conduction eyeglasses, the spectacle kind of uh, the bone conduction eyeglasses, and the metallic, uh, you know, the bone conduction hearing aids that were already available. And then the sound bite, just a small picture here. Uh, this this is a uh, technology that didn't stand the test of time. Uh, it it was basically a dental clip, uh, which uh, actually had the receiver and the sound vibrator, and that would uh, give it to the transmitter, which is which is in the ear, and so based purely on bone conduction physiology. Somehow, I think for very obvious reasons, it, it was very cumbersome to be holding it in the mouth. It didn't work. And then we have transcutaneous bone conduction devices. Again, here we have passive and active, and I'll discuss this further. Passive bone conduction devices include the Baha Track, which is uh, quite popular today. There was also the Sophono Alpha, I just have a slide on that. And then active bone conduction devices. The most popular one today is the Medel Bone Bridge, and I will discuss that also. Uh, we can uh, beleaguer on that. And then the newer generation cochlear ossea and orticon sensu. So what is, I think, becoming more popular as a classification, probably a little hard to uh, understand, but then uh, there's, there's a logical engineering uh, background to this classification because Bo Hackinson is a professor of technology. I met him uh, personally, amazing uh, source of inspiration at uh, Chalmers University in uh, Gothenburg, the birthplace of uh, Baha. And he's uh, divided this into direct bone drive and over the skin drive devices. And direct bone drive can be percutaneous vibration just as the Baha and the Ponto. And then transcutaneous induction, it can be an electromagnetic transducer or, or a piezoelectric transducer. So, so two very different uh, physical principles there. Ossia is the piezoelectric one. Uh, the sensio and the bone bridge are the electromagnetic ones. So, so these are direct bone drive BCDs. Over the skin drive is the non-surgical option that I told you, the ad here, the eyeglasses, the sound arc, and the Baha soft band. And then the transcutaneous vibration ones, which is the Baha tract and the sophono. I think this, this is a very useful classification. You can't get it easily over the top of your head. But this is something, you know, it is an exam question. And I think it, uh, practically it is very useful to know it this way because uh, this is from an engineering uh, point of view and how it works point of view. Let's look at Baha. Baha has been around for as long as cochlear implants have been around, almost as long, 40 years of research. 1977 was the first patient with the Baha in Gothenburg. And the Chelstrom did it. More than 160,000. That's 1.6 lakh beneficiaries across the world. But in India, we've had only about 350 plus. And for all the reasons that I already told you, we could go through that again. Father of fossil integration, a dentist, uh, who was from Gothenburg, passed away a few years ago, who uh, discovered suddenly, I mean, accidentally, uh, what is called osseointegration, where in a rabbit experiment, he found that an osteocyte integrated so well, in, if you can see that uh, picture there, osteocyte with titanium. So he used some titanium Im implants and uh, he could see that it integrated really well without um, any, any uh, reaction to it. And the bonding was very stable, very uh, strong. And this led to the dental implants in 1960s, understandably, following which uh, Chelstrom got uh, involved to look at a bone anchored uh, hearing aid. And uh, like I said, 40 years of R&D has gone into it. And uh, I think uh, 
Cochlear did really well in acquiring NTFIC uh, medical systems. And uh, this is the principle of it. Essentially, there's a, there's a titanium screw that goes into the bone that anchors into bone. Then it's called the uh, bone uh, uh, conduction implant. Uh, and, and that is, it used to be called the fixture before. And then there is a connector piece in between that's called the abutment. And today it's called the derma lock. And then the processor on the outside. Uh, and today it's called the Baja Connect System 5. And then the higher powered ones are called power and super power uh, uh, processors. How do you hear with the Baja? You, you're all aware of the Ondorf's theories of bone conduction. Uh, this essentially, as you can see, conduct sounds via bone directly to the cochlea. So it, it taps the compressional mode of bone conduction physiology, not so much the inertial and the osteotympanic modes. So that's Baha for you. What are the indications? We uh, put them into clinical and uh, audiological criteria or indications. Clinical, by far, in my opinion, at least in India, the biggest uh, uh, cohort of candidates are in this, with congenital oral atresias, congenital middle ear anomalies, be it syndromic or non-syndromic. And then there are all the others, including autosclerosis, discharging mastoid cavities, chronic otitis external, it's an indication in, in the Western population, and Down syndrome, NPCs, and even the causes of single-sided deafness. Uh, we'll come to that. Audiological indications, and I think this, this is worth uh, remembering as a 45, 55, 65 rule. We're looking at uh, the four tone average of the bone conduction thresholds. If that is around 45, a uh, system five Baha will work for them. If it is around 55, you need a power Baha, system five. If it is 65, you need a super power Baha. The older generations were called different things, where I learned it uh, from Birmingham. Um, an airborne gap of 15 decibels or worse is uh, desirable. Speech discrimination should be better than 60%. And any patient who is non-compliant for conventional aids is a candidate. Single-sided deafness, Dr. Keaton alluded to it. There are candidates and there are indications for bilateral Baha too. So how does Baha work in single-sided deafness? Someone asked this question. If it is single-sided deafness of long-term duration, we're not talking about sudden deafness, short-term duration, six months, one year, two years, three years, where you know a cochlear implant will work, as I put there in the end of the slide. But if this person has had a long-term single-sided deafness, SSD, a cochlear implant is unlikely to work. And then here, I was surprised Dr. Keaton didn't bring it up. He knows I do what's called trans tympanic uh, EABR, uh, electrically evoked uh, auditory brainstem re response. So we could actually, if there is a long standing SSD or any other uh, indications where you're not so sure if an electrical stimulation of the cochlea will really work, this is a good way to to find out if it works. And that's called TTEABR, trans tympanic EABR. Uh, you make a small myringotomy in the posterior inferior quadrant, and there is this uh, tiny uh, hockey stick kind of uh, electrode that goes to the round window membrane. You don't, you just direct towards the round window membrane and stimulate the cochlea. You have an implant in the box, a simulator as we call it, that stimulates. This is like a single channel extra cochlear electrode, but then it can elicit a bearer, an electrical bearer. So that's EABR. And if you can elicit a wave five with that, even in a long-standing SSD or in those anomalies that we were discussing, then an electrical stimulation is possible. You will definitely consider a cochlear implant. And uh, my uh, audiology colleague, uh, Apuru Kumar and myself have published on this. Uh, Samir knows that this was an invited article in the Indian Journal and we've published two, three other papers related to TTABR. I would uh, encourage you to go through that. So that's how, in single-sided deafness, the Baha works. Now, a big advantage of the Baha is this trial that you can do with the soft band or the, or the bite block or even the sound arc. The Baha sound arc is, 
is is a uh, is a new uh, technology that is available so essentially you wear this like you see there and you can uh, you can try it out readily so we we are looking at the uh, the patient delight factor or the wow factor on the trial with the baha soft band or the sound art and uh, and to be very honest if the indications are right like i showed you audiologically and clinically speaking especially the uh, bilateral oral atresias with macrocious the wow factor is absolutely amazing they like it so much and uh, and this is something you know so unfortunately you can't do with the ci we can definitely do it with with uh, this uh, conductive pure conductive or uh, mixed uh, deafness patients so the baha trial and conditioning is possible with the soft band uh, for example the baha is fda cleared for 5 years in the bar so if you're looking at below 5 years you could uh, uh, readily give them a soft band and the child will not miss out on sounds in the first few years of life and when they are ready for the surgery we go ahead and do the surgery similarly the sound arc so if someone wants to try it out and then convert to an actual surgery 6 months or 1 year down the line it's definitely possible and the same processor can be used uh you know post surgery uh with the magnet or with the connect abutment the surgery can be single stage or two stage and it lately we have been doing uh, younger children with single stage itself if you get a good 3 mm depth uh with, with in the cortex you go ahead and do a single stage uh, procedure but in those with the, with not so much of uh, bone thickness if it's uh, less than 2.5 mm Uh, especially in children poor bone quality irradiated bones and so on and so forth you would look at a two stage procedure where you put the baha fixture the implant first with the cover screw close it wait for osseo integration come back 6 months later and go ahead and put the either the magnet inside or do the connect uh, abutment the derma lock we used to have different incisions from from when i trained uh, in birmingham 1995 onwards uh we've changed uh, uh you know and evolved uh, so to speak to to what is called a c incision now like you see in the last uh, picture there we used to do a lot of soft tissue uh, reduction the idea was that the processor on the outside should not touch the uh, soft tissue around uh, around the uh, the assembly the abutment and the fixture assembly the implant uh, assembly uh because you don't want feedback you don't want friction and hence soft tissue reactions especially in thick scabs but we don't do that anymore we don't do that at all anymore because look at the difference here that greater effect that you would cause with the with the old uh, technique of soft tissue reduction and hence we had so many uh, peri abutment uh, soft tissue reactions and the classification with it uh, we changed that and look at how quickly healing happens with the new uh, baha connect derma lock system so this is where we are today so the baha 5 system is the latest uh, system um and the activation is as early as 4 weeks as in uh, you can switch on if you can call that as early as 4 weeks compared to 2 months and 3 months and 6 months in the past so so that's what uh, the latest uh, baha uh, plans are but with the baha connect like i told you it's no longer called the abutment it's called the derma lock and there's this white coating around uh, which is a uh, hydroxyapatite and then it actually reduces uh, the soft tissue reactions that we discussed and the osseo integration is much better today with the with the screws with the with the threads of the implant with the tio blast coating tio is a titanium oxide coating amazing technology and and those who do not want that percutaneous you know piercing through the skin uh, system uh, you could look at the baha 5 attract system which is a magnet based uh, uh, philosophy so you have the as you can see the the implant inside which is the fixture with the screw that also integrates and then there is the magnet on the inside it's called the bim 400 uh, that's the baha implant magnet 400 that is the implant magnet on the inside and that's all the surgical part the external part includes the speech processor magnet sp magnet on the outside with the processor i told you there's the simple system 5 processor and then the power processor and the super power processor 
So that's essentially a transcutaneous passive bone conduction device, quite popular at the moment. So that's that's the portfolio of the Baha from Cochlear. Cochlear acquired Entific Medical Systems somewhere in 2004, five, and I think they've done extremely well with the research and development from there on. So the Baha Connects available around four and a half lakhs. Baha Tracks available around five lakhs. The non-surgical options of both the Sound Arc and the Baha uh, uh, Soft Band are available around two and a half to three lakhs. Then there's the Oticon Ponto, not come to India, but this is pretty similar to the Baha Connect that I have talked about. That's again a percutaneous passive um, bone conduction device. The transcutaneous passive devices include the Sophono Alpha. And I think about four or five implants have happened in India. I think the company is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from the US. Uh, they're not done well because you can see, imagine what it is to have two magnets inside and two magnets outside. There's a lot of uh, skin reaction. Although the power is very good, there is a lot of uh, skin and soft tissue issue, uh, especially in the tropical climate that we are in, and with all the sweating and hygiene issues that we may have in this country. So not very popular here. Cochlear has come up with a transcutaneous active bone conduction device called the OSEA. It's US FDA tiered also. And uh, this is again a, a magnet-based uh, system, uh, as in uh, the transfer of energy is with the piezoelectric uh, tech, uh, link. Uh, but uh, but there is a lot of energy that's transferred to the actual uh, screw that goes in there. Uh, not come to India yet, but um, we are watching this space. A similar one is called the Sensio, again from Sweden. Forty pounds taken over it. Still in clinical trials, not coming to Vogue yet. Uh, what's definitely popular and has uh, nearly about 15 to 20 years of uh, uh, research and development is the Medel Bone Bridge, which at the moment is the only active bone conduction implant transcutaneous that is commercially available. Medel Bone Bridge can be placed in three classical uh, positions. It can be uh, behind the ear, the, the mastoid position, which is roughly at the sinodural angle. You can have an occipital position way far behind, as you can see there, or you can even have a temporal position. Uh, that's the bone bridge with the with what's called a BCFMT, the floating mass transducer, which is uh, uh, which is uh, which goes inside, and then there is a. The, there's the coil, which is the implanted uh, electronics, and then the, the processor outside is called the Samba processor. The depth you need is about 8.7 millimeters for that uh, FMT, BC FMT to go in. And uh, there's a kit that comes, the surgical kit called the BCI sizer kit and the BCI kit uh, with the bone bridge all uh, included. And, uh, and uh, so essentially, you need to make a, a kettle pot bed uh, behind the ear in the mastoid and not, not a conical uh, bed because you, you need the whole of the FMT to go inside 8.7 millimeters. And that's the challenge at the moment for us. Uh, but where you don't get that kind of depth, you can put what are called BCI lifts on either side. We can uh, put in uh, those extra little lifts on either side for the screws, the fixation screws. I should probably show you that uh, in a minute. And that's how it will look on implantation. Uh, and, and then again, ready to be activated once the healing is uh, is over. What's the difference between active and passive? I've, I've kept on saying that. That's the difference. An active BCD generates the stimulation inside. The implant generates the stimulation. It's directly onto the bone. The processor outside just collects the, the sound and gives it to the implanted electronics and that actual vibration is inside there. It's a higher output, more stable output. And uh, whereas a Baha attract, for example, would be like this, uh, the picture of this side, the sound processor outside generates the stimulation and it attenuates through skin. So the benefits are a little lower, the output is a little lower compared to an active device. Let's, uh, like I said, I'll show you the videos towards the end. Uh, the classification of middle ear implantable hearing devices. Again, piezoelectric 
and electromagnetic devices. Now, the piezoelectric devices somehow didn't do well at all. They didn't stand the test of time. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. This is the cochlear tika. This is the totally implantable cochlear uh, actuator. And what it, well, they did was collect the information uh, from the external auditory canal. Look at where the microphone is. It's in the EAC. And then the whole process is uh, directly driven uh, to the incus there. Now, a similar technology was the NYS team from Europe. And Dr. Mohan did a few of these surgeries and uh, surgically very challenging. This uses the tympanic membrane in itself as the natural uh, microphone and then collects the information from the, uh, from the body of incus and then drives it to the head of stapes. So you'll have to dislocate the IS joint. So the processing happens between the sensor and the driver. Uh, Dr. Mohan tells me it took about six, seven hours per surgery, very challenging. But then it it stood the test of uh, science, but it, it didn't stand the test of uh, commerce. Somehow the expenses were so high, the company just couldn't market it. And I think uh, they went uh, kaput after that. But the electromagnetic devices have done fairly better. And there are quite a few. Uh, for example, there's the Autotronix uh, Maxim by Michael Paparella. He passed away again but very recently. Uh, amazing gentleman, you know Paparella. And, uh, sorry, Michael Glasscock and, uh, of the Glasscock and uh, Shambo. And, uh, and, and look at uh, this device. And I'm told this is uh, going through a clinical uh, trials phase. Uh, to, to make it a viable option. But what's definitely been there for a couple of decades or probably longer is the vibrant song bridge. Again, uh, money-wise, it seems a little steep, but then the patients who've actually had it are extremely excited and uh, satisfied with the quality of sound and with the benefits and with the outcomes they've got. So essentially, the FMT, the floating mass transducer, the energy driver, is hooked on to the long process of incus here. And then there is the implanted electronics called, called the warp, and then the audio processor on the outside called the Amade processor. So you can actually, so this is again an, an exam kind of question, what are the different types of vibroplasty? So where you position the FMT, would decide what is the type of vibroplasty. And the indications for those will be audiologically very different. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going through that. But type one is what goes to the long process of incus, like I showed you on the previous slide. Type two is like uh, is like what is shown there. It goes on to the short process of incus. So you do uh, uh, an extended uh, aditotomy and then place it uh, floating, uh, but fixed to the uh, short process of incus. Then you can have a type 3 where the head of stapes with the coupler is given the FMT. You can also have a type 4 like you see in the last picture there where the round window is stimulated with the coupler. It can happen in chronic uh, mastoid cavities, etc. Uh, etc. Et when do you do a bone bridge? When do you do a sound bridge? So, so there are some uh, indications and uh, criteria for the same. So if there are difficult ear pathologies, malformation, single-sided deafness, you think about a bone bridge. But then if it's a severe mixed hearing loss, because if there is a significant sensory neural component, you're looking at a vibrant sound bridge. Let's look at what's happening in India. What's the incidence of congenital oral anomalies? We don't know. Like I keep saying, God only knows. But then the guesstimate is around one to four per 2,000 live births or 3,000 live births, because we know profound deafness is about three per 1,000 live births. This is probably, in that sense, one per 1,000 live births or maybe half per 1,000 live births, but still a huge number, huge number of congenital oral uh, atresias. Maybe I should ask Ashish Bunker about it. Incidence of single-sided deafness, again, God only knows. I think there are plenty out there not even seeking uh, medical advice, not even going to any physician or surgeon. I don't think we want to get into CSOMs, discharging ears, and autosclerosis. I, I would uh, prefer to do stepidotomy 
uh, in these patients because you know all of us are surgeons basically and then i think we are doing pretty well with stepidotomies but then increasingly baha is being advised or bone conduction devices are being advised for bilateral otosclerosis at least in the national health systems abroad so that's an example of who's a candidate and i personally feel we should push governments to look at this very seriously we need to make uh, our police aware of the archdorfer staging system of congenital oral atresia also and i think again this is very practical very useful so if the score out of uh, 10 is more than 6 then you're looking at some kind of atresioplasty middle ear reconstruction to uh, to you know bypass that uh, maximal conductive loss these patients have if it, if the score is uh, 5 4 or so you wouldn't even dare do that you're looking at a baha or a bone conduction device from 2000 onwards about 350 patients with baha some with the processor and soft band and sound arcs so that's roughly the breakup there this is from the company 140 baha connects 160 baha tracks and about 50 using the uh, the band or the sound arc problems there have been a few like i said uh, you know skin reactions we've had especially with the old technique uh, with the older uh, uh, implants older uh, uh, devices that we had uh, there's a grading for uh, soft tissue issues uh, called the holger grading i would like you to read that up and we've had a few issues but nothing that couldn't be corrected nothing life threatening to be very honest and more and more lately with the c incision like i said there are fewer or nil uh, wound related uh, issues what about the sound bridge the vibrant sound bridge is uh, about 40 to 50 i'm told by the company um, i haven't done one but there have been a few of my colleagues who've done across the country again it seems like a vanity affair at the moment maybe these patients are doing fine with the with the digital hearing aids they are they're getting so it is really difficult to convince them it's not so easy uh, to convince them to look at the sound bridge at the moment bone bridge is a little more popular than that and uh, again about 90 maybe reaching 100 now and uh, they've done extremely well for all the uh, right indications just as the baha and this is an active uh, device like i told you so let's look at the baha attract uh, surgery and then uh, so I go to another quick presentation. Okay. So Anil, you have to tell me if, uh, or Indrajit, you have to tell me if you're seeing the second presentation. Yes, we are. No, but now it's gone. It's gone. Thank you, Tadayamo. We'll get there. Now, yes, yes, guys. Yes, sir. We can see. Yeah. So those are the surgical steps. Let's just very quickly go through it in five minutes. Uh, so that's the site marking. You. So if it's a microtia patient, you want to place it as far away from the from the future pin you know whatever reconstruction you're planning to do so it's it's you draw the frankfurt plane and you're about 45 degrees above and about 5.5 to 6 centimeters away so there's a template available for the uh, future processor and you use that and you do the marking like so all right and then you measure the skin flap uh, thickness by using a needle poking it right down to bone and measuring that and make sure there's sufficient uh, skin flap thickness and not more than six millimeters. We, we don't need more than six millimeters. And like we do with the cochlear implant, the tattooing the implant site is more critical here, may not be so much with the implant, cochlear implant. So, so we tattoo that with methylene blue because that's where you want to see the, uh, 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 the screw, the fixture, the implant going in. And then infiltrate, uh, we do a C-shaped uh, incision, like I said. Uh, the actual uh, magnet inside is about uh, three centimeters diameter, and you want to be away from the edge of the magnet. So you are 
about 1.5 uh, uh, centimeters, about 15 millimeters, either behind or in front of the magnet. It makes sense to do it behind because you don't want to uh, interfere with the fascia and the muscle there, which could be used for reconstruction of the auricle later. That's the incision. So you make a C incision and you lift the flap. Is the video playing okay, Indrajit? Yeah. So you lift the flap like so. Yes. Right down to periosteum. You saw that? It's right down to periosteum, but not including the periosteum. So you leave behind the periosteum and go right up to the uh, to the tattoo mark uh, that you have made. You do a flap uh, stay suture after that, and then you incise the periosteum in the form of a cruciate uh, incision, like I'm doing there, exactly at the tattooed uh, point. So cruciate incision, and then the four flaps are elevated just about uh, a centimeter or so. And then there is a, there are several components to the Baha. Uh, this is called the guide drill. So you, you're getting either a three millimeter or a four millimeter depth uh, of, uh, of that hole that the implant goes into. So this is the uh, Oscora drill system. And uh, there is a spe special handpiece. The rotation here is uh, 2000 RPM in the fast mode. And that's what we're doing. We are going perpendicularly. Look at that uh, drill indicator, which gives you that you have to be perpendicular to the flat surface of the bone. And you go in and out, in and out. The spacer, if you remove that white spacer you see there, if you remove that, you get four millimeters. But uh, with the spacer, you get three millimeters depth. There's a depth gauge available. Hethil Patel, our dear friend and KM, uh, HOD currently, uh, has uh, devised these depth gauges with Kalelkar, and they, these are available 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4 millimeter depth gauges. And, and those are very useful here. And then you have what is called the countersink. So, what uh, a 3 millimeter or 4 millimeter uh, drill hole you made, you want to widen it with the widening uh, drill, uh, which also countersinks in, and that's what you do with this. And that uh, I think widens it to about um, uh, four millimeters. Then the implant template is used to make sure you got sufficient uh, tissue uh, elevation all around. And now you're ready to put the actual uh, Baha implant. Uh, this is called the BI 300 now. And uh, that's that's the that's what's called the capsule, the ampule in the pick and place instrument set that the whole thing comes with. Uh, there are various components to it. And you do not want to touch the actual titanium there. Uh, titanium should not be uh, touched by the gloved fingers, blood, soft tissue, because it immediately starts reacting. So you pick and place it very carefully, take it on, feed it on to the uh, implant inserter directly onto the drill. The implant insert, inserter is stainless steel. You can touch that and you load it on there. And then very slowly, so there's another program on the, on the Oscura system the drill system, and you would use that and very slowly in the 15 RPM mode, you you insert the uh, implant, the, the fixture. It is self-tapping. It creates its own uh, uh, threads as it goes in. And uh, you put it at a particular uh, torque adjustment, which is about 20 to 30 Newton centimeters for children and about 40 to 50 maybe for adults for compact moons. And you can actually increase the torque also so that the flange goes right down onto the surface of the bone with a very slight countersink. And then there's something called the bone bed indicator. This is just to make sure uh, you want to put the magnet, uh, internal magnet uh, later. Uh, so before you do that, you want to make sure there's no uh, uneven bone surface or even the periosteum soft tissue around. So you use the bone bed indicator, you can see the scheme uh, on the other side, uh, and you rotate it around and make sure you have a flat bone surface. If you don't, you will drill it a little bit with a regular drill and, uh, and reduce a bit of the periosteum if need be also. Following that, you will put the implant uh, magnet, I told you, and um, that, that is actually the end of the story. This is uh, 
the screwdriver which is used to tighten it. You tighten it manually as much as possible. And then there is a torque adjustment that is possible with the torque uh, wrench uh, device. And the company's recommendation is to tighten it like you're seeing there on the video. You need to tighten it right up to 25 Newton centimeters. That's what you do. Okay, that's the torque adjustment. And then you do the final check and then you close it. And um, healing is very quick. The patient can be discharged. This can be daycare surgery. And then the patient is discharged and activated, like I said, four weeks. That's all it is. So I'm going back to my main uh, presentation again. I have about five to 10 minutes more, uh, Anil. I hope uh, I'm okay. Yes, sir. Great, sir. Yeah. So I have a quick uh, bone bridge video which is exactly four minutes. Are you seeing the? Yes, sir. Yeah. Video seen? Yes, sir. No Same freezing. Scene. No freezing. Yeah. Okay. So it's a regular postural incision, infiltration. Um, so pretty much like uh, what we do these days for uh, cochlear implants. The placement that I'm showing you here is the classic placement in the mastoid. Um, so again, this comes with the B BCI kit, uh, the bone bridge kit. So that's the placement of the of the BCFNT, as we call it. This was a few years ago when we did the first uh, bone bridge surgery, and uh, so you it it's uh, the width from the, the two fixation screws is I think roughly about 25 millimeters, maybe a little less. So 25 millimeters abound below. So the above screw is, is at the temporal line, the below screw is at the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid. So it's very easy to do in an adult. Now in children, you know, I don't know if you get that kind of depth that you want, 8.7. Millimeter depth is what we need that we may not get in every patient. So there, there are templates again for for the inside. There's a, a T coil and a uh, sorry T sizer and a C sizer. C is the coil sizer. You saw that and uh, T is the transducer sizer. And there's a handle for it uh, for these uh, templates. So you use that all along. So it's actually pretty simple once you get the hang of it and you do the marking like like you're watching here the video is on a fast forward mode you can see that so once you mark that you're happy with where you want the you know future screws above and below like i marked there and there i told you the temporal line above and the insertion of the master sternocleidal master below. You create that bone bridge bed, essentially the FMT bed. And that I told you should be like a, like a kettle pot, not a cone. So if you had a, those milling birds, those cylindrical birds, or even the conical birds, you know, that I, I keep seeing Dr. Vijendra using it very often. Somehow I haven't got hold of it. I don't know who makes it. Someone needs to tell me that. Those are very useful here, really uh, drills very well. And, and look at how I have got that depth without reaching the, this was an adult patient with single-sided deafness, without reaching the, the dura, you know, the, the sinus or the dura upstairs. So that's what you need. And once you got that, you, you drill holes for the two screws that you want to put upstairs and downstairs, like so. In one shot, very perpendicular. You shouldn't widen it. It should just go in and out. I think that's about six millimeters uh, depth. And there are screws available for that. And the, the golden screws there. And then there's an emergency screw. So once you've got that, you're ready to put the implant, which I've done. And I'm putting in the screws and tightening it. And again, there is a torque adjustment here, like you saw with the Baja tract that you saw before.
I think another minute of the video and uh, so there's the torque wrench again here and roughly about 10 to 20 newton centimeters is the torque adjustment you do for both the screws here and if there is any gap on uh, you know with, with the screw anywhere between the bone and the and the screw uh, which you would have assessed earlier you would put what is called a bci lift in this case the gap was hardly 0.5 uh, millimeters i think on the inferior uh, screw I just used some bone patty I'd collected earlier on and uh, placed that there. And that's what you do and then you're ready for closure. Um, again, activation is as soon as the healing is over. I think we activated this patient uh, uh, three weeks uh, down the line. He did very well, single-sided uh, deafness. Okay, very quickly, I think I have three minutes, few slides on ABI, no videos. ABI. Thanks to Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran, he's really popularized it, is essentially for those that can't have a cochlear implant. So these can be uh, candidates with NF2 or even those without the cochlea, like Dr. Kitane told you, uh, the indications, and let's go through that. So the, where this is placed is in the, in the floor of the fourth ventricle where the cochlear nucleus is. And the cochlear nucleus, it has tonal opacity. Look at that you have low frequency fibers on the outside and high frequency fibers medially placed, centrally placed. So, so we need both the ventral and the dorsal cochlear nuclei yeah, stimulated through the foramen of uh, Lushka, lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. Translab or retrosigmoid uh, approaches are uh, popular, but translab is what, uh, what is done. Uh, well, we, we, we do both the techniques. Uh, Dr. Vasudevan, who's in uh, Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran's team, uh, does it really well uh, with the retrosigmoid approach. Translab is when you're doing uh, NF2 surgeries also. The, there are plenty of anatomical landmarks. There are some classifications with the degree of difficulty with the flocculus of the cerebellum. Dr. Mohan has published on that. So we need to keep all that in mind. The choroid plexus, visualizing the choroid plexus is very crucial. This is the retrosigmoid approach here and where this is just this flat surface uh, electrode that goes just in. It's so magical to watch that happen. We've had two surgeries in, uh, with, with us. Uh, Dr. Mohan's team came down and uh, did for us. Bilateral NF2 is an indication. Cochlear anomalies like aplasia, hypoplasia, cochlear aperture and nerve anomalies aplasia, hypoplasia, ossified cochlea are all indications. As an example of who would benefit ossified cochlea, they'll do extremely well with the uh, ABI. Several investigations, including the one that I keep uh, popularizing, trans tympanic EABR is, is really useful, but you need to do everything else that has been discussed as with CI. Intraoperative monitoring is very crucial, not just the seventh nerve, you're looking at electrically evoked uh, brainstem responses with the with the system in place you are monitoring even the all the other uh, lower cranial nerves all and and the fifth nerve as well here this is definitely a neurosurgical option uh, operation no doubts about it uh, this is the i think the very first implant with nf2 uh, that uh, got the abi with dr mohan so you do a post operative x ray you can do a post operative ct scan just to make sure it's in place the switch on happens in the icu because you know, you want to be very uh, careful about stimulating other centers there. You know, all the vital centers are there in the medulla oblongata, the respiratory center, the inspiratory, the expiratory center, the vasomotor center for the heart, and the chemoreceptor trigger zone, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all uh, right up there, and you could be stimulating any of these with any of these uh, electrodes. So you need to be extremely careful, monitor them in the ICU during the switch on. This is our very first uh, implantee, uh, came from Tanzania. Who we'll look at her uh, aided ASSR. She is in the speech uh, banana there with the aided ASSR. It takes a long time to rehabilitate these patients. It takes a good uh, three years, not, not like the one year uh, that happens with the cochlear implant. So, Murph has had 54, Apollo Delhi, Amit Kishore is in about eight, and um, uh, Ravi has done a few of these. Uh, Neuralic um, implants at the KKRs. So, finally, some take home messages. 
to run a hearing implant team is not so easy but it has to be a team concept and and the best coordinator the leader of the team is the audiologist i think dr kitne emphasized this time and again i'm saying it for the sake of emphasis repeating it the audiologist is the coordinator awareness about hearing implants has to seriously improve especially these other i think everybody knows about cis but when it comes to all these other uh, technologies somehow the awareness is grossly uh, lacking if the volumes improve the cost will definitely be lower indigenous uh, implants are the way forward not just with ci with these also if someone can come up with that titanium screw here in india for 50000 i'll be very grateful uh, there's a thought for juniors and we need to push our uh, government programs at least to consider the bilateral oral literacy yes uh for for a bone conduction implant i think that should be possible thank you very much for your patient listening thank you dr sunil sir it was a very good talk quite informative and uh, nicely recorded videos with good demonstration thank you very much uh, i was i have a question hello yes so am i audible yeah yeah anil go ahead okay sir there is one question from dr prakash munka from uh, bahayko steel city uh, the question is uh, bahay is basically conductive hearing uh, for conductive hearing loss when conductive hearing loss in most cases is tackled by surgery or hearing aids sn and mixed conductive hearing loss Uh, cochlear implant gives excellent results where is the place for baha is it not the reason for uh, less number of cases let's see I, i i think i explained that very clearly with the yards doffer staging system yes. so, yes. so 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 i look look at simply the congenital oral atresias how many of these patients can you actually do atresioplasty we are not talking about uh, or auricular reconstruction it's atresioplasty to obviate the 60 decibel maximal conductive loss that these patients have can we do that in every patient we can't i i think we need to look at that many of these patients are just out there doing nothing they have not even come to uh, to the doctor you want my feeling so to say like that that they can all be helped by surgery i, I don't think so they can, okay not all can be and and as far as sensory neural loss is concerned we're not talking about profound loss we're talking about mixed losses those losses where hearing not they do to block the ear and then there's this occlusion effect and what not so yes uh, please get there but but we need to keep our minds open for that possibility also that may not okay. be a huge population but congenital oral atresia i think is a huge population in several lakh yes and the primary question from shruti bansal from mumbai option sometimes wait wait samir is saying something samir no what i was saying is that baha sometimes is a better option because uh, in these congenital ears the results you may attempt surgery but you may not get a great result so i'm saying so this re 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 revision the best guys remember lens from five or eight or ten surgeries to get a very good result uh, with the atresioplasties and medial reconstructions and you know, i don't think uh, we can afford that in this country okay sir. and there is one more question sir from uh, shruti bansal from bombay if the patient gets bilateral otosclerosis we operate the worst ear patient developed dead ear patient survived on left hearing for 30 years now he is the he has profound loss on the left side too which ear you do prefer cochlear implant not for me or dr kitne but i can answer it i would yes, left ear i would prefer the left ear but dr kirtane can correct me for because that's yes. recently uh, lost hearing right so i would prefer the left ear but what's uh, important is to see how much is the cochlear otosclerosis component radiologically 
you need to see if the left ear is favorable for an electrode uh, insertion. I, I hope it will be because the right ear has been uh, deadened for several more years. And like we said, you know, we are not sure if an implant will really stimulate uh, the dead ear that side. So left ear. Sir, you want to improve on that okay. answer? Kirtanya, sir. He's uh, muted. Okay. Now I agree with you that more recently deaf and ear would be always the better option. Yeah. 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 We just need to make sure it's okay to put in an electrode. Osteoporosis uh, okay. has its own challenges. Uh, yeah. Electrode there is the contour advance like the AOS technique Dr. Kirtane showed. You would want something stiff to push it inside. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And something that doesn't stimulate the facial nerve. Uh, uh, you know, the full banded electrode stimulates the facial nerve in cochlear autosclerosis. Yeah, so nowadays, most of the electrodes that are coming in have got uh, electrodes facing towards the modulus. So then we uh, otherwise you might get fake because the solid tissue in the cochlea would allow the current to spread to the facial nerve. Yeah. Any other questions? There was something left for me to answer. I can I'll be happy to answer. No, sir. Hmm? No Nothing other questions. Thank you very much, sir, Kirtan sir, and uh, Sunil sir. It was a very good discussion and a learning issue uh, for all of us. Thank you so much. Sunil, fantastic job. Beautifully covered. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, sir. really proud of the work that you're doing, Sunil. Samir, sir, thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank you. an opportunity to meet all the people, uh, great people. Okay, so Samir, are we permitted to leave now? Yes, sir. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, thank you, sir, Sunil, for that uh, lovely overview of the entire hearing implants uh, in India. In fact, you gave us a, uh, an overview of what's going on abroad as well. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ninad and Dr. Anil for uh, moderating this session so well. Samir, sir. Thank you. Aushal, sir. So we meet again uh, next Wednesday and uh, thank you yes, for uh, attending the session. Sir, we had more than 3,500 uh, registrations for this AOI lecture series so far. And this is something that's on uh, our YouTube uh, uh, channel as well. So it can be viewed by people whenever they want to. Samir, sir, let's have a photo session. Okay. Uh, yes, I have already taken it. Vimlesh can do the honor. I think all of us are here. Let's yes. pose now. Let's pose. <laughs> Just smile. <I> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chalo. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Thank and Samir, keep up the good work. Enough, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bharti, sir. Madam, uh, good night. Kaushal, sir, good night. Good night, good night. Good night, Anil, sir. Good night, good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bharti, madam, if she's there, she has to uh, commercialize her uh, headlight uh, face shield. <laughs> yes, yes, we are all looking for the, So, we've seen that prototype. I think it needs to be. Uh, we'll have a lecture on that now. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Okay, bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir.